All right, everybody, welcome back from break. Uh, the next uh, the next item on the agenda here is going to be a presentation on QML from uh, Zara. Uh, so take it away, Zara. Thanks, Roland. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Zara Renagi, data scientist on the solution architect team at NVIDIA. Um, like Roland mentioned, uh, also a former NISAP postdoc. Um, in my current role, I work with HPC users and DOE labs, um, and it's actually great to be able to continue working with Rollin, uh, Lori, and others at NERSC, um, and to be with you all today remotely. So I'll talk a little bit about QML before we get to the notebook examples, just a couple of minutes to review what Nick mentioned earlier. Um, and the goal is to be able to import a GPU library, for example, QML, instead of scikit-learn and run machine learning algorithms on GPUs without having to write CUDA code. Um, of course, it's just sometimes we saw uh, the QDF examples. It's sometimes as easy as just changing the import. Uh, you just import a different library, but sometimes it requires changing a few parameters and keywords and we'll see a couple of those examples in the QML notebooks. Uh, but the overall goal is to complement what already exists. We don't want to replace existing frameworks, but mostly complement um, some of the other frameworks that currently run on GPU too. Okay. Um, and so this is what the software stack looks like today. The top layer that's exposed to the user is Python. Underneath we have Cython wrapping, um, which connects the C++ to the Python layer. Our core algorithms are built uh, in a combination of CUDA libraries like um, Thrust, QSpars, QSolver, and we also have machine learning primitives. Um, what these primitives are, um, they're basically building blocks of some of the basic operations that make the bulk of our machine learning algorithm. So they can be um, the core linear algebra functions, um, distance functions, norms, transpose, and so on. And another nice thing is we're actually working on wrapping these primitives in Python too. And so if there's an algorithm that you're interested in working on and it's not in our roadmap and we're not working on those, you can actually use these building blocks and um, create them or test them without, again, having to write CUDA C++ code. And so this is the status of our algorithms today. Um, like Nick mentioned earlier, we'll see a couple of those like um, linear regression, logistic regression and UMAP. Uh, some of them, like uh, linear regression, random forest, currently run on multi-GPU and multi-node. Uh, but some of the other ones were in the process of uh, working on them too and extending them to multi-node, multi-GPU. So this is the roadmap as we get closer to 1.0. Okay, so now let's go through the notebook examples, can you see my notebook? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. I was just wondering if I'm still sharing. Okay, so we have three notebooks, um, more like two because the first and second one are very similar. Uh, when I'm doing this, I actually ran through these on my local workstation. Um, so if you see uh, the output when I run NVIDIA SMI or in my terminal here, um, it'll show that I'm running on Quadro GB 100s. Uh, basically, these are Quadro cards compared to the Tesla cards that you're running on Core GPUs. They're basically the same, uh, but one is designed for the server, which are the Tesla cards, and another one, uh, Quadro, is uh, for workstation. So basically, what all it has is as cooling and display boards uh, because it's a graphics card rather just an accelerator. So. Uh, I'll use that. And another thing that I wanted to mention is I'll close these tabs so we can see the whole screen um, and hopefully it'll be large enough to go through it. But this is um, through NV dashboard that we actually added, I think, a few months ago. So it's really nice that you can monitor your GPU utilization and GPU memory while you're going through these notebooks. 
Before this, one thing that we used to do was that just run NVIDIA SMI and watch our GPU to monitor this. But this is much nicer. And um, so this was installed in the container that I'm running, which is 0.13. So I think it should be in the same one on NERSC. But basically what it is, it's called in the dashboard. You can install it too. Uh, so you can pip install. Um, but if you're running a similar container, it should be um, in your Jupyter notebooks on the left too. So you can click on system dashboards and click what else you want to look at. So you, for example, here I have GPU utilization and memory. Um, and then PCIe and NVLink throughput are actually interesting if you're running or when we get to the DAS workflows, it'll be interesting to look at those too. So that's all I wanted to mention. I'll leave this here in case we have some time to uh, run through UMAP. That, that's where we'll see a lot of uh, GPU utilization. Um, but let's get started with the first one. So uh, the first one is linear regression, which mostly it'll include uh, basic fundamentals of QML. Um, for those of you that are familiar with scikit-learn and have used scikit-learn, uh, the API looks very similar. So some of it might actually be super easy and straightforward. Uh, but the goal is to basically just use some random data uh, or synthetic data to use QML and port the code from scikit-learn to QML to run on GPUs. Um, and then the second part of this notebook, we actually have a hyperparameter optimiz optimization example. Um, and the nice thing about that is that we're actually compatible with other HPO packages that scikit-learn can use. For example, if you use Dask ML, um, you can use QML with that or scikit-learn. Um, and we'll see that example too. And again, the whole point is we can use that um, HPO from scikit-learn to run our QML estimators and QML algorithms, and you don't need to use another library or create your own. Um, and then in the second notebook, we'll get to logistic regression, which, which is very similar to this first one. Um, and the goal is implementing what you've learned in the first notebook. So it's very short, very similar, just a few differences um, that I'll talk about when we get to that. And then finally, we have a notebook with UMAP to see how we can visualize MNIST data sets. Uh, we'll compare that with TSNE2 and then use two um, data sets, one with digits and another one uh, with fashion data sets. So that includes like boots and clothes and things like that. So let's start with this one. Uh, in the first cell, we're just, we're gonna import some of the libraries that we need uh, like matplotlib and numpy. And can I mention here, um, we're just going to use and create random data set in this example. And then here we just want to plot this. So what we're doing is we're just adding some random noise to Y. Um, and then we want to see how that looks. So this is our relationship between X and Y, which is this black line. And then the other points around it is um, the data that we created. So we'll use um, scikit-learn uh, to run logistic regression. Um, again, so you'll see throughout these notebooks that we check the version two. Um, so for example, the scikit-learn one that we had is 0.21. And this is really useful for Rapids 2 since we have almost like a six week release. So it's good to keep track of what you're running to if there are any issues or if you want to report any bugs later on, it's um, good to just keep track of that. And then this is using um, importing linear regression from scikit-learn. And actually scikit-learn APIs is pretty user friendly. What we did here is we're just gonna create an object. Um, and then this is the object that will create the ordinary least square regression. Basically what it will try to do is it'll try to fit a line to the data set that we just created. And what it'll do is it'll minimize the square distance between these observations and then the true relationship, which is this line. 
And it's basically one of the introductory machine learning algorithms that's commonly used. So then next thing that we do is we run fit. We'll use NumPy and so like a NumPy functionality uh, to create a format that scikit-learn accepts. So in this case, um, it'll be expanding that data set. So what we did was we created this X that's uh, one variable. So it's equal to a column. And what NumPy expand does is it just creates a column on our X, X expands the shape of the array and then with the position that we mentioned here. So if we look at X, this is the array, the shape, and then we can run numpy.expand uh, to create this data set. Um, one thing that I mentioned, I think in the example here, we had Y, uh, so just a slight modification to change that to Y noisy where we want to fit the data. Um, and then what we do next is uh, we want to run that to see how that will fit. So we run here our fit to um, see the train our model. And then what we do after that here, we want to create another set of data to uh, run inference. So basically we want to predict how this matches with the trained uh, model that we just created. Uh, we'll again use some of the NumPy functionalities could, to create a linear space, basically a grid of these points. Um, and again, in this case, it's just a single line because it's one dimension. And then with running predict, uh, we uh, predict these new inputs. Um, and what it does basically underneath, it's a matrix multipl multiplication. But some of the more sophisticated algorithms can be more complex and computationally expensive. But in this case, it's just a matrix multiply. And then finally here, what we're doing is we're plotting the true line, the predicted relationship, which is scikit-learn on CPU. So the red line that you can see here. Um, and then what we realize this actually matches with the true relationship line. And what that means is that it fits and it worked pretty well. So um, with the training data set with the white noise, it means the optimization process to minimize that error of the observations to the line fit um, and it worked really well because we can't see the black line. So what we're going to do and the next step is run the same algorithm on QML um, and it the goal is for it to be very similar to what we just had. So importing a different library. However, here, the first exercise was to create a QDF data frame. Um, now, one thing that I should mention is you don't necessarily need to create QDF to use QML. Now, in a lot of cases, it's recommended because like you can run some of the other operations faster, like the examples that we saw in the QDF notebooks. But QML can actually, you can pass um, QPy and NumPy arrays too. So if you really wanted to test this feed, what you can do is use the same array from the previous um, section and then pass that in without creating a QDF data frame. So it really depends on the workflow. Uh, if you're already having working with a data set that you're, and we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the uh, logistic regression, but if you already have a data, for example, if it's in a QPy format or it's a NumPy and you don't want to convert it because you're using other frameworks too, like PyTorch, you can easily do that and you can still use QML. So what we did here, again, we were going to import QML. This is the current version, which should be similar to the one that you have on Quarry. Um, and then here, again, similar to the scikit-learn version, we'll just import linear regression and we'll just name it linear regression GPU to not confuse it with the other one. Um, and again, we'll instantiate our linear regression object and fit it. Um, and this example, it's exactly the same as the scikit-learn version that we saw. Um, and this, these are the parameters, the default parameters that it's going to use. So um, what we did was similar to scikit-learn that you'll have some of these default parameters. We've added those two. 
And the goal is, so if a user is new to, let's say, a linear regression, and they don't know there are different options for the solvers, why would they use one over the other? By default, we'll do an educated guess for a solver for you. And in this example, it'll be um, eigen decomposition, which is one of the faster ones. Um, and then the other parameter is going to be fit intercept true, and uh, we're not going to normalize the data. So that's going to be false. Now, again, in this example, we have a trained model. And what we want to do is, um, again, visualize this to see how this compares to our CPU uh, prediction. And then the true line that we had, that was the relationship between Y and X. One thing is you'll probably see a lot of this warning. So especially I think in the last cell or the one before the last, um, it basically means that training for training, we're using column major and prediction requires row major data. So there's inconsistency between the data, uh, but that will result in an overhead in um, additional memory usage. So we're just showing or presenting this, that this is happening uh, in QML. Uh, but so it's not really a bug. It's more of a feature request that we're working on and you shouldn't see this in the next couple of release. And then, so this is the final graph. Uh, we'll, we have the uh, black line, red line for scikit-learn and green line for QML. Uh, green line is on top of both. So uh, all are matching. I think we up to 12 digits, almost the same exact answers on CPU and GPU. However, sometimes we're not running the same exact algorithm as scikit-learn. Sometimes we're implementing algorithms that make more sense for GPUs or for a massive parallelism. Um, so it might be a different solver. And neither is right or wrong. It's just a different approximation that we're using. Yeah. And if you really want to compare the same exact algorithms, you might have to adjust parameters um, or, or, or solvers to uh, be able to compare like apples to apples. Sometimes though, this is uh, to our advantage and we can get better results in QML. Um, and the reason for that is we can optimize more times. We have an optimization loop that we can actually take advantage of because we can run more times since we're faster. Um, so overall, sometimes we have to, uh, we're using basically like I mentioned, different uh, implementations. Okay, so now let's look at a, a hyperparameter optimization example or hyperparameter tuning, which basically is a process of choosing a set of optimal hyperparameters for a algorithm or a learning algorithm. Um, and these parameters are usually randomly set by the user before training. <clears throat> so these are things that we can modify and you can either do that by hand, so try a different set of alphas, sorry, hyperparameters, but usually um, it's more efficient to use HPO. Uh, and we'll see that example, there's a different methods that you can actually use all the combinations of the proposed parameters or just randomly select a few and then compare uh, performance and accuracy to see which parameters will give you the best results. So what we're going to do for this example, we're going to use the diabetes data set from scikit-learn. Uh, scikit-learn actually has a few built-in data sets that is actually really good for testing and running demos and sample notebooks like these. Um, and we'll run HBO in this case for ridge regression. Um, and so the, for this example, we'll have one parameter to work with, which is alpha. And for other algorithms, we might actually have a lot of different parameters. So if anyone has done deep learning, you know that HBO can actually optimize a lot of different parameters. For example, let's say training widths in a neural network. Um, and the nice thing about that is, like I said, you can go through all of the possibilities or do a random search um, and then compare the performance of those to find the best ones. So what we're doing here is after creating that data set, we uh, just split that to train and test split. So here uh, we're just setting the test size at 0.2. So we're keeping 20% of that for test. And then here's 
similar to the previous one, we're just going to import uh, uh, Ridge uh, from scikit-learn. Um, and, and here we've just added some of the details about differences of the uh, scikit-learn and QML examples. Uh, so both approximate the same thing, but QML currently has three different solvers um, and scikit-learn has some of the other ones. So the only one that's in common between the two right now is SVD. And like I mentioned earlier in the previous section, sometimes we're not comparing the same exact parameters. And for scikit-learn, actually, Autosolver is a good option. What they do is they have heuristics that actually can choose the best solver for you based on your data set size and other options like your uh, type of data that you're using. Uh, we haven't implemented this in um, QML yet, so we don't have an Autosolver. Um, and one of the reasons is that for complex algorithms, we still don't have good heuristic and we want to basically see more use cases to figure out which ones will give us best performance. So what we're gonna do here, we'll create ridge regression objects, again, fit them, um, and then run predict on both of these. Um, what I did here and the CPU and the GPU version, I explicitly added the parameters that I used, uh, but you can use the default um, and basically uh, just call the solver, so select the solver. And then what I did here is I uh, ran score, so we can run the prediction and compare accuracy of these two uh, we use the built-in accuracy, which what it does is, it's the squared of the sum of the errors between the observations, all the points that we had and the line that we're fitting. So the lower value means that's better and we want to optimize on that for HBO. And if you, um, so when, when we got to that, the, um, hint was that you can actually use grid search from scikit-learn and use your QML estimator. Uh, so like I said, we'll basically use certain points of the parameter uh, to explore. We have alpha in this example, so we'll set the value from minus three uh, to uh, minus one. So we'll have 10 points. Um, uniformly the distributed points and in this case logarithmic um, and then we'll do the grid search try all the 10 points we're generating we're using grid search so that will use all the points um, and another way to actually run this you can actually uh, select random search too and that would make sense if you have a larger um, array that you're actually using more data that you want to run on. So if you have a lot of hyperparameters and if you run grid search, so if you actually test all of them, it might take hours or days to actually run through that. So it really depends on the number of parameters and how many different values you want to test. And then in the next part, we'll create our grid search object, um, adding the ridge from scikit-learn and then the optimization strategy is R2 scoring. And then at the end of that, we'll fit the model. Um, and then at the end, the, if we check the best parameters and best score, if you read it, we'll actually see different values. But in this case, for example, um, it'll give you the output of the estimator that was used and then the uh, best parameter and then the best score. So, if we want to run the same thing with QML, you basically, <coughs> excuse me, um, we'll run grid search CV from scikit-learn and run fit again with our QML algorithm. <coughs> excuse me. And it processes without issues actually. Um, and you'll be able to see the results. The only thing is again, the warnings that I mentioned earlier that hopefully you will see that in the next release. And then because there's a lot to scroll down, I'm comparing um, the output from QML with scikit-learn and they're very similar. 
So this Can I ask you a question, Zara, sure. about those warnings? Yeah. So you see those because like your data are row format and it's expecting column format and I guess it's converting for you. Yes, exactly. Um, so does that mean like you should just always be working in column format like from the beginning? So, so that's the thing. Um, as based on the latest, I think for the FRIT and the training is expecting column format, but for inference is expecting row format. So, and that's because we're using the forest inference library. So it's within QML too, that depending on what you're running, it's expecting different formats of data. Um, so this was actually something that I think I saw um, an issue on GitHub that Nick mentioned. Um, so I wonder if Nick has more details on that. If he's still online. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Um, thanks. So yeah, you, you pretty much nailed it. Um, Lori, the in general, most, op most operations that we're doing will want a column major memory layout. But in this specific case, the pipeline of predict after fit needs different ones. And that's something that's being, um, that's being worked on in, in I guess, currently. Um, in general, though, column major is what we would usually say. OK. So in the future, this will become column major, or it'll just stop warning you? <laughs> Um, in the future, it will probably be whatever the appropriate, um, memory layout is. Um, I think that's going to depend on a variety of things. Okay. Thank you both. Okay. Are there any more questions? Are we uh, yeah. All right. So we have a question uh, from Venkitesh, and uh, he says, "I can't learn itself performs well on GPUs uh, parallelization over data batches, but how much extra performance does QML give?" So, um, as far as I know, actually, scikit learn. I don't think you can run that on GPUs, um, and so that's what we're doing. We're porting a lot of these algorithms to run on GPUs. Now, there's a scikit-learn API, for example, if you use XGBoost. But then again, underneath, uh, that's using a lot of the implementations that we've added. Uh, maybe, Venkitesh, you want to unmute and explain um, more? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, that was a mistake. I'm I'm use Keras and that one parallelizes oh. the GPU. So I thought maybe Scikit-Learn does it too. But right. I think what you're saying is Scikit-Learn doesn't, and no. And GPU CUML is the only way to do it. Exactly correct. Okay. And, and that's actually one of and I I mentioned that earlier too. What we're doing is we're trying to complement what already exists. So if you're for example using PyTorch. You should, and I think uh, Nick had a slide on that too. You should be able to pass your data between the different libraries now, so QML or PyTorch with zero copies, so you do, you wouldn't have to go back to CPU. Um, so right, if you have a workload that you're using PyTorch on GPUs, but Scikit-Learn on CPU, you can now use QML to continue that on the GPU. So the whole goal is to be able to do end-to-end -end data science without having to go back to CPU and. Uh, we don't want that additional overhead, communication overhead. Okay, thank you. I just have a follow-up on that, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Using something like Keras, there are a very, it does panelize over different GPUs. Uh, then it seems like maybe you can just use that. But it, most workflows have this data reading aspect of it, where things get slow and so it seems like the score who DF could help there because you did analyze the uh, data reading a part of it over, to, uh, you know, over the GPU. Yeah. So is there a way to combine uh, C, uh, uh, CDF and Keras, something like that? Right, exactly. That's the goal. So you can use QDF to load your data onto GPUs, you can load it faster and then run any of the pre-processing, feature engineering, anything that you might need. And then yes, pass that to like a deep learning framework or a QML and 
continue with your training. So you would have to convert the uh, after the processing, convert everything to NumPy and Pandas, and then give it to the other deep learning learning. So no, if you're using, for example, PyTorch or TensorFlow, some of these uh, frameworks that currently work with uh, GPU arrays. So if you use the CUDA array interface, then you know you don't need to even convert that back to NumPy or Pandas. You can directly use your CuPy array. Um, or for example, for XGBoost, you can directly pass your QDF data frame um, for your learning algorithms. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. So what I, I won't really go through all the cells for this notebook because like I mentioned, it's very similar to the first one. The only difference is this is logistic regression. So basically it's a classification algorithm uh, when it's used when actually the dependent variable is binary, but linear regression that we saw earlier, uh, usually the dependent variable, variable and outcome is continuous. Um, so there are a few differences. The first one is you'll see here that we're using CuPy, which Nick mentioned earlier too. So I, I, I really encourage you to look at the documentation for this. It's actually a really nice package. It's very interesting. Um, and if you're already familiar with NumPy, the API is very similar, uh, but underneath it's actually using CUDA to create arrays on GPUs. And the goal of this notebook is to deal with data that already exists. So let's say, for example, you already have a CuPy array and you have a workflow or in PyTorch and you want to use QML, would you have to convert your data or how can you convert it uh, between, for example, CuPy and NumPy? And so when we set up our data, similar to the previous notebook, uh, we'll uh, import uh, logistic regression in this case. Um, and then the main part is actually fitting the scikit-learn, this part is uh, fitting the scikit-learn logistic regression. And one point is this is a GPU array. So if you're using a CPU algorithm, you can't really pass that. So you need to convert it to a NumPy array and the data has to be on the host. There's a couple of ways to do this. Um, I think the hint here was to convert it actually to a NumPy array. So you can do that with this, so do CuPy as NumPy, and that will convert your CuPy array to NumPy array. Or another way that can, you can do this is with this get call to move a device array to the host. So that's similar to what was already in the notebook, or you can use the hint and actually convert it to a NumPy array and then run the score again and your results will be similar. And so uh, what we'll do is for the second part, we'll use QML logistic regression that it can actually train models with CuPy. So that's what uh, we talked about earlier that you don't necessarily have to convert your data to even a QDF uh, or a QDF data frame. You can use uh, CuPy arrays for training um, these machine learning algorithms on the GPU. Although the difference here is you'll see this, that we didn't have this and the, G, and the CPU version, for example, is that you have to define your data type. And what that means is this is what's expected for um, QML. So if Xtrain was double precision, so numpy.float, Ytrain should also be the same data type. So what we can do is we can use this QPy functionality to convert the array from one data type to another. However, another thing that you can do is, this was, this is actually, I think it's pretty exciting because um, you can set this convert data type to true and QML can do that for you. Um, I think this was actually added in the last couple of releases, but the only thing is um, what, the only disadvantage is that you'll, it'll use more memory uh, because it's doing that conversion for you. And so because of that, by default, it's off. So if you want to use this, you can just use convert data type to true and converting the data manually can actually be that optimization step. So if you use this, um, it, it's more efficient and you'll use actually less memory, GPU memory. 
Um, and then we compare the results and logistic regression. And this example, we get a better uh, result actually on the GPU. And one of the reasons is it's an iterative solver. So in this example, the GPU acceleration can actually allow us to get better results by running this more and, and faster. So we have about 10 minutes and I can go through this UVAP notebook, uh, but I'll just pause here if there are any other questions. Sure, so uh, we have a question from Jan. Uh, he wants to know if Kupai can convert to float 16. Ooh, that's a good question, uh, but I'm not sure. Nick, do you know that? Sorry, I'm on mute, uh, yes. It can. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll go through the last notebook. Um, I'll try to go through this quickly again. Um, we're using UMAP and convert, uh, comparing that with TSNE. Um, we're going to use the MNIST data set. Um, so we'll have two types of data set. One is uh, numbers and another one is called the fashion MNIST data set. So if we look at our data here, um, each handwritten number is actually a 28 by 28 image, uh, which is actually a, a single array. So to graph it, we have to reshape it and for a machine learning algorithm, what this means is this is actually a 28 squared number of dimension array and not an image per se. So it's relatively a high dimension data and problem, and it would be difficult to use a scatter plot uh, to look at this and plot this. And this is an example of uh, dimension reduction. So we can use UMAP or TSNE uh, to go from 28 square to two or three dimensions for visualization. Um, and, and these are some of the algorithms that try to solve this problem. For example, uh, TSNE and UPAP are used for this, but essentially what they do is model this in a higher dimension and make assumption of how the data is distributed in this higher dimension. And then the case of UMAP, it actually makes the assumption that it's uniformly distributed and a projection from the top of these objects can project in a lower dimension space. And this is what we see uh, when we, we can think of it like a shadow of these dots. Hey, uh, Zara, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it seems like our video may have frozen. Um, oh. Maybe you want to unshare and reshare? Okay, let me try that. <clears throat> So, what we basically want to do is we'll look at these data sets with TSNE and UMAP, um, and then we'll just see different distribution of these and different clustering methods when we compare the two. Um, so, for the CPU version, we'll use the UMAP learn package. Um, that should already come in the uh, container if you're using that. If not, then you probably have to install that if you're installing it through Conda. Um, and then what we did was we can create the object by uh, selecting the number of neighbors, uh, which at some point does the nearest neighbor search and it's in high dimensional space, which could be actually a hyperparameter to optimize to. So if you want to run that, that would be something interesting to look at your results and compare them. Um, and then the example that I had, I modified the number of neighbors with to 15. So the one that you actually saw was five, but you can change that. And the default is actually 15 too. And what that means is larger values will result in more global views. And then smaller ones will maintain a local structure of the data. Um, so basically smaller values were, will concentrate on the local structure and the larger ones will create larger neighborhoods as we call it. And there's also an initialization strategy. So as you can imagine, it has to start from somewhere when it tries to calculate how many different types of clusters there are. And this is doing an experimental initialization 
um, called spectral use, for example, in this case. Um, it uses spectral clustering. Um, so um, it took, for me, um, with the 15 uh, number of neighbors, it took about a minute and a half to run on the CPU. And obviously, that depends on the CPU that you're running and the number of cores. Um, and then we'll go when we go through and use QML, we'll create a QDF data frame and then the same call from QML. So it'll be QML UMAP with the same parameters. Um, and then we do pretty much support all the parameters and we'll see that that will actually go from a minute and a half on CPU to about three seconds on GPU. And it's actually interesting to plot the results to um, it's really nice. It creates a different visualization compared to TSNE, and it's a lot of times it's actually more informative to use UMAP. And for example, if you look at the output, you'll see that it clusters uh, four, seven, and nine, and then like eight, five, and three uh, together. So those are more similar in the way they look. Um, and then another thing that I added, which I um, encourage you to add that to, is a parameter called random state. Uh, which sometimes when you run through the GPU version running through at different times, you might not get the same output. So, you, so the visualization might not look the same. So if you select this random state parameter, which is basically the seed used by the random number generator during in initialization and optimization, um, it was added to QML uh, in the current release. So it's actually pretty new. So in 0.13, which matches the CPU implementation. And what this will give you is you can reproduce results. So across different runs, now your results will look very similar. So almost the same. And so one thing is, um, one of the reasons that I recommend using this is for QML, I mentioned that we're improving performance, adding a lot of parallelism, but it sometimes becomes challenging for the optimization stage. So all that parallelism might cause slightly different results, even with the same speed, and sometimes it can impact our determinism too. So uh, setting a random state will enable this consistency and we'll get similar results, I think up to three digits of precision, but it can also potentially be slower uh, training, maybe by a few seconds, and it can increase the memory use issue. Uh, so the second exercise was the same, it's just using a different data set. So you can use the fashion MNIST data set. Um, you'll Sorry to interrupt you again. So your screen is frozen, um, which is fine, but maybe just uh, so you know, we can't see what you're seeing. Yeah, that's, so that's, I think, Nick's screen because mine just, I think, I don't know, for some reason doesn't show anything. Oh, all right, now that scrolls. Yeah, so I, I think Zara might, something might be up with your Zoom settings. I, I think I can scroll if that's, if that's useful. I'm not sure. It was just odd that it was working and then it suddenly stopped. Um, now, well, now you have it. I think now it actually, you have it again. Yeah, so I have to, okay. Let's see if I can run through these examples and I can run through them and show you these results later too, because it's actually nice to look at them, but let's just try to run the GPU version. It's just a little uh, slower to scroll too. Okay, well, um, <laughs> all of our participants should have your notebook and should be yeah. working on it themselves. So uh, we'll just encourage everyone again to, to run through it. Sounds good. Um, and, I'll, and I can share screenshots of it too, um, and just to see how it looks. So um, when the next person, or th throughout the break, I can just do that. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, uh, thank you very much, Zara. Do, does anyone have questions about QML uh, or any uh, of the methods we just talked about? Pretty quiet on chat. Uh, maybe people are hungry, but yeah, it's close yeah, to so. watch over there. Sure, thank you. Oh, we're actually going to start, I believe, with like a last five minutes from Zara. Is that right? Yeah, I'll try okay. to take a few minutes. Okay, great. Thank you, Zara. So Zara is going to um, finish up the part of the presentation where she had problems right before lunch. So. Uh, 
I look forward to that. Okay, thanks, Zara. Thanks, Roland. Sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. So I just wanted to show you the graphs. I don't want to take too much time, but because I was talking about this and I was actually super excited about it because it's a really nice visualization, um, I just wanted to share it with you. So this is the one with the um, uh, digits, uh, with the data set, with the numbers. And I was mentioning earlier that if you run this, if you run the QML UMAP, um, you can run the CPU version too, but basically the point is you'll see these clusters and, and this one, uh, for example, four and nine and seven are in one cluster. And then another one we have like two, uh, three, eight um, and five that are similar in shape. Um, and then for the second part, um, that's also another data set. And, and the difference with this is again, it's from MNIST, but it's the fashion data set. Uh, so it's going to be very similar if you run through it. And again, we compared it with TSNE. Um, and then if you run through that, um, here's the random state that I was mentioning earlier, if you want to be able to get reproducible results when you run it a few times on the GPU. Um, and this is what it finally looks like. Again, very interesting. Um, you can see that, for example, um, the different images of uh, dress and coat um, and then shirts are in the same cluster. And then the other one, we have like sandals and sneakers and ankle boots. So, um, and another thing is, uh, I mentioned that earlier too, that I changed the number of neighbors here to 15 rather than five in the initial one. So like I said, this is another parameter that you can uh, modify. You can run high parameter optimization on. And then the last part is just applying the trustworthiness to compare the QML UMAP and C CPU UMAP. Um, and then the higher score will actually indicate that the GPU implementation is comparable to the CPU one, which is about 97, 98%. Um, so if you compare this with the original input, we can check how well the algorithm did in preserving that local neighborhood structure. Um, so to what extent that local structure was maintained, it's basically a way for us to also measure that performance. So that's all I had for now. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free, because we didn't really get to go through all the cells of this notebook, feel free to reach out to um, us or uh, Roland and Lori, and uh, we'll be happy to help you um, and with any questions or issues. Like I mentioned earlier, part of my role is also supporting users um, with some of my other colleagues. Um, and so I think Max Gass on the call too. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions and we'll be happy to help you. Um, and I won't take any more time. I'll hand it over to Viva.